Hey everyone, this is John Buck. I'm back. Uh, again, this is the second video in the series on imperfection or perturbations in arrays. We're going to develop our model about the array element location errors. Uh, this assumes you've already seen the first video about sort of the conceptual big picture of what's happening and how we're going to model it. Uh, and then we're going to uh, go on in this one. So if you haven't seen that first video, stop this one and go watch it first. But again, before we think about uh, what changes when we perturb the array, we should first talk about what the nominal or normal ideal response is before the error starts, just so we have a baseline for comparison. So our beam pattern for array weights w, b of, if, if we think about a vector k, a plane wave coming with a ray, uh, propagation vector wave number k, we, we said that well, this beam pattern is how this single spatial filter w, given one set of array weights, how does it respond to every possible uh, input signal uh, v of k? Right, so we just take the inner product where k is now my function here. Right, we say for every possible plane wave with a different wave vector k, this is the uh, expression we get, this inner product, if we write it out term by term. And what we're going to look at today, the original response, th these are all uh, based on a, a paper I should have mentioned by uh, Gilbert and Morgan in the Bell Systems Technical Journal in, uh, I believe it was 1955. In, in Bell, Bell Systems Technical Journal. Uh, and I, I will uh, distribute the, the reference for this in class, too, so people can look at it. And also, the similar argument appears in section 2.6.3 of the Van Trees textbook. But for Gilbert and Morgan's original result, and what we're going to look at today, is something called the power pattern. So again, the nominal or ideal version is just if a beam pattern often operates in voltages or pressure in Pascal. The power pattern is, is related to the square of that. So we're going to say it's the, the magnitude squared of B of K, right? Which if we want to find the magnitude squared of something, one easy way to do that is to multiply it by its conjugate. So let's do that. We get this. And so now we can write this out as two sums. This is going to be the product of two sums. And to keep them straight, I'm going to give them different dummy variables for the index of summation. So I'll have one summed over n, like I just saw there. And then the second one, when I take the conjugate of this and multiply it by itself, I will get the second term looks like this, because when I take the conjugate of a sum, it's, I bring the conjugate inside the sum, and then I take the conjugate of each term. So w star becomes w, and e to the minus j becomes e to the plus j. And so multiplying these through, I'm going to have all the cross terms, right? This is like a giant foil, if you like, from, from uh, algebra, except instead of just multiplying pairs of terms, each of these things has n elements in it. So I'll have n squared terms in the sum before I'm done. If I put that all together, I'm going to pause just to, to the video to save time while I write it out. So I'm taking the sum over all n and all m. One is conjugated, one isn't. e to the minus j, and I've combined these two exponentials and 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 factor the k transpose out front, the wave number. So I have k transpose times pn and pm. And I should have, just to remind ourselves, right, p sub n is the coordinates of the nth sensor, right? So that's the vector that's a three element, three dimensional vector that tells me where to find the nth sensor in Cartesian space, right? So that's the, the nominal result I'm, I'm supposedly looking for. Now let's see what our model is for how do we model that perturbation and think about it. So to model the perturbation, we say, well, if I have, this is my linear array and these were my sensors on the axis originally. And now what we're saying is that like the nth one has been perturbed to some new location we're gonna call uh, P tilde of n. We're gonna say that's equal to the original vector, three dimensional vector Pn plus, again, a perturbation vector that is itself, this is a 3D vector. Right, so this thing is a small error that gets added onto the position in all three dimensions. It's going to have possibly perturbations in the x and y dimension as well as the z dimension. Right, so the delta z is, is this difference between, or I'm sorry, delta p is the difference between these for each of the n vectors. And to make this the, the simplest thing we can still actually practically analyze, we're going to assume that these errors, delta p of n, are real Gaussians with zero mean and the same independent variance for each of the three axes, right? So this is the three-dimensional identity vector. So we're saying this random vector is a Gaussian random process 
where the three components are independent with equal variance sigma p squared, right? And we're going to assume all delta p n's and delta p m that the perturbations are independent when I'm looking at different sensors, so when n is not equal to m. So I'm assuming these perturbations are Gaussian distributed around the nominal location, and when n is not equal to m, that they're independent as well. Okay, and so this is, this is what we're going to do to, to analyze this model. Um, and, and so we're going to say we know what our nominal beam pattern is. Let's go now and, and look at how that expression changes for the power pattern when we put in this error and see what we get. So now we have the power pattern for the perturbed array. Right? We're using the same weights w as the nominal array. The, the model we're taking in mind here is that we don't know the array's been messed with. right? So we think we've got our nice, perfect, pristine array, and we've designed our array weights to, to work with that perfect, ideal array. But reality, you know, either sloppy construction or wear and tear or whatever has, has perturbed the elements away from where we think they are. So, so this B tilde, this is our perturbed beam pattern. And we find that by applying the same weights, but now the manifold vector is also, we have a perturbed manifold vector. It's saying, well, this is what you would really see with the new element positions, the perturbed ele element positions, if, if the plane wave coming from direction k hit the true perturbed array that you don't know about the errors in. This is what we'd actually see. That tells us the beam pattern. And we can then go on and say, well, what's the, the uh, power pattern as well, right? The power pattern here would be the magnitude of b tilde squared, which again we would say is, is b tilde for the, the wave vector k times its conjugate. And I would get the same big thing I saw on the previous page, so I'm going to pause while I copy that over quickly, uh, except the, the, all the p's would be replaced by p, p tilde, the perturbed element position. Okay, so when, then when I look at this, you know, I've got the same type of expression here, this double sum with all the possible cross terms of the two sums from this. And the only thing that's changed is the true array positions are now the perturbed ones. I still have the, the vector wave number here, but I have these. And knowing that the perturbations are random means this whole thing is a random variable, right? That the, these perturbations are inside these perturbed positions are random variables. So this thing is itself a function of a random variable and therefore a random variable, even though I haven't changed the weights. Uh, in fact, and so let's let's write that out to make it clear where the perturbations are, right? The, the idea here is that we're going to look at each of these and say that P tilde is the true P plus a delta P for, for both N and M. So we can fill that in next. And when we've, we fill that in, we've got something that looks like this, right? Each of these has been expanded, pushing the minus sign through. And I could actually regroup this and using properties of exponentials, write this as two different exponentials, one of which is the nominal and one of which is the new one. So let's see how that works out. All right, so when I do that, I'll get the sum over m and n, wn conjugate wm, e to the minus j k wave number transpose, and then I'll have the, the nominal vector locations pn minus pm, and then another e to the minus j k transpose times, again, the perturbation vector. So this is a three-dimensional vector that is the random part for the nth sensor and the mth sensor, the difference of those. And so what's nice about this is I've got all the nominal stuff here, and then this is the random thing, right? Here's where all the randomness is hidden, because both of these are Gaussian vectors to mo the model of per the random perturbation, right? So if we have a, a, a random thing, we normally want to say, well, the first thing we want to say is on average, what's the impact of the randomness. We'd like to get the average and the variance, but let's start with the average. So we'd say our, our goal now, now that we've got this far, is we want to look at what is the expected value of the perturbed power pattern as a function of wave number versus the nominal, you know, how different is, the, on average, how different is this perturbed thing from the original ideal nominal power pattern. Right, so that's what we're trying to look at. Now that we've set that up, uh, I'm going to stop this video here. In the next video, in the next exciting episode, 
uh, we'll start uh, seeing how we're actually going to analyze this. Okay.